Hey, Relentless Goal Achievers, Eric here. Listen, before we launch this episode, I got to tell you, after we recorded it, I had a conversation with Chris Smith. By the way, this episode is going to blow your mind. It's amazing. He's such a great coach. Um, but he gifted to me a one-hour video lesson from his eight-week masterclass called Selling as a Leader. So I encourage you to download it or watch it. It's inside of our arsenal. The arsenal is a place I created where I put together a bunch of PDFs and things that can help you. Uh, also, Martha Krejci gave us her 90 minutes to 90 days of content. Julie Riesler gave us her workbook for achieving the life that you want. So all of that resides inside of the arsenal, including the gift that Chris Smith is leaving for us. Uh, link is in the description. Be sure that after you listen to this episode, it's going to be amazing. It's probably one of my favorite ones all year. Uh, you go check out the arsenal and uh, I'll see you on the next episode. Enjoy this show. Bye, everybody. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of the Relentless Goal Achievers podcast. I hope you guys are doing extremely well today. Thank you for joining. I got an incredible guest. And, and before I introduce my guest, let me just share with you. You know, uh, if you've seen the podcast with Kusuri, if you've seen the podcast with Ankush, I started it off with me reaching out to the ultimate coach and saying, hey, uh, would you come on my podcast? And he says, no. <laughs> Actually, I reached out with an email. I get a call back later that day saying, hey, thanks for inviting me to your podcast, but um, I'm not going to come on your show. However, I got a few people that I think you would absolutely enjoy interviewing. And one of the people that Steve recommended is Chris Smith. So, Chris, welcome to the podcast. Let me let me just share with with people who you are. Chris is first and foremost a husband and a father. Very proud at that. Uh, his wife, Melissa, is his hero, and his five children are his best friends. <laughs> wow, five kids, man. He's a coach <laughs> and a consultant, and together with his wife, they're leading the family development movement. He's also the founder of the, camp, uh, of the Campfire Effect, where they teach organizations to talk about what they do that is as powerful as what they actually do. So, Chris, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. I'm stoked uh, and honored to be here, man. Yeah, uh, let me let me just devote the first part of this to Steve Hardison, the ultimate coach. How do you know Steve? Like, what's your relationship? Yeah, it's it's actually, you know, a funny story. I sat in Steve's office 10 years ago. And I was introduced to him by his sons. So I'd met his two sons and they said, man, you kind of remind you kind of remind us of our dad. You should you should meet with our dad. So I go meet with Steve 10 years ago. And I just had this profound experience. And I just remember like, wow, like there's something, this guy's a force of nature. He's intense. He's powerful. And I just, at that time, wasn't in a place that, you know, I was, uh, that I was going to coach with him, but I, I remember that experience. And then fast forward wait, 10 what years. Were, how did you know his sons and why did they, like when you met, was it like over dinner or was it an actual coaching? Like, what did they say to Steve to meet with you? Yeah. So I, I had actually, my first real career was in commercial real estate. So I was a commercial real estate broker for five years, had some success in that. They were just getting started in commercial real estate. And Got so it. a mutual friend said, Hey, you should talk. So we went to breakfast one day. And as we were talking, they just, one of the, I can't remember which son said to the other, Hey, doesn't he remind you of dad? And it's like, yeah, he kind of does. Like you should meet with our dad. And I was like, well, who's your dad? And they said, Steve Hardison. And I said, well, what's he do? And they go, you should just meet with our dad. <laughs> <laughs> so I went and had, you know, the experience that a lot of people have. And then over the, over the course of that 10 years is where I really kind of found the thing that I felt called to do in the world. And I got really deep into ontological leadership, which ontology is the study of being. And so I just, I just became fascinated with two things, leadership and language, right? Leadership. How are we showing up in the world and language? What's the language that we speak that creates the world we live into in our lives, our marriages, and our businesses? And so I was really fascinated with that. I uh, I knew about the book, The Ultimate Coach. I knew that it had been written about Steve. I got added to the Facebook group somehow, but I never participated in the Facebook group. I didn't feel called at all to read the book. I just knew it was there. And then one day, out of nowhere, I think I was sitting in church, and all of a sudden, I just kind of have this thought, like, hey, go buy The Ultimate Coach. And I think that was in March of this year, maybe. April. So I read it and immediately I'm like, wow, he really does remind me of me. Like I remembered what his sons had said 10 years before. And as the more I read his story, the more I'm, I can really relate. And so I just reach the out. The first to part, him. like the, the first part of the book that talks about his upbringing. 
Yeah. Well, his upbringing, his career, like the thing for things he tried, like just a lot of it. So I just reach out and say, Hey, thank, tell, tell Amy, thank you for writing this book. It's really impacting me. And then I think I reached out a couple, a week later and said, Hey, I want to come to a be with session. So, you know, wired him the money to go do a be with, which is a two hour session. Mm -hmm. And then within probably 20 minutes of being with him in the be with session, I knew I was going to do a full engagement. And then probably a month later, I wired him the money to do a, a full year of coaching. And uh, I've been coaching with him ever since. What was missing for you? Like, why did you, what was it about Steve that you felt like would get you to that next level? And what was, what were you, what did you feel like was missing? Yeah, it's, it's really interesting. I don't know that I felt like anything was missing and I knew that there was more that was possible. Mm. And that to me has just been this reoccurring theme in my life. Like, I don't know why, but ever since I was a little kid, I've just been fascinated with possibility and what could be possible because possibility kind of lives out there beyond what we can currently see. So there's like, there's, there's what I currently can see and there's what I currently know, but there's always more that's possible than what we can currently see and what we can, what we currently know. The question is how do I get access to it if I don't see it and I don't know it? What made you think that Steve was the guy to help you? Well, I just, I just have, I just felt like in my experience of him and just some of the, some of the possibility he spoke into me, like within 20 minutes, he was already helping me see that more was possible than I could see. All right. Like what? I, well, just, just the possibility of who I could become as a husband, as a father, like who I could become as a leader, who I could become as a coach, as a consultant. Okay. So let's, and I think that's actually really interesting. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Finish. Well, right. well no, I did. I actually think it's pretty rare. I think we, I think we take for granted how rare it is to have anyone speak any kind of possibility into you. Mm. I think we live in a world today where most people go weeks, months, years without another human being speaking any possibility into their life. When you say that, is that, is that synonymous with words of encouragement or is it more than that? Not words of encouragement, but words of like seeing you for your potential or is it yeah, the I, potential? No, I, I think it's, I think it's, 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 it is that and it's even a little bit the name of your show, right? But it's like, it's beyond what you can see as possible for yourself. Sure. And see, I don't think there's a lot of usefulness, Eric. In my experience, there's not a lot of usefulness in what you and I can currently see. I mean, it's useful because it's gotten us where we're at, but it's also only gotten us where we're at. So like whatever I can see, there's some usefulness in it, but it's also really limiting. What's what's fascinating to me is, well, what's what's out there that's beyond what I can see? And how do I tap into it if I can't see it? Well, it's always through another person, a leader who shows up in your life who helps you see that more. And that's one of the first definitions we teach of leadership in our coaching program is that leaders help you see more as possible for your life than you can see for yourself. Yeah. So real quick, I mean, sounds based on how you wrote your intro or whoever wrote your intro. I mean, your values are your family. That's probably the top value for you. If I could guess, and I don't, we just met 10 minutes ago. Yeah. Um, the fact that your five children are your best friends and your, you and your wife are doing so much stuff together. That's really cool. My wife is my business partner as well. And my two boys are my best friends. Um, but I don't want any more. I'll tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I would take, I would take one or two more in a heartbeat. Um, <laughs> but so you're, sounds like you're a great husband, great father. Um, what did Steve make you see as a possibility that you didn't see? When it comes to being a parent or in your marriage. That there was a more powerful way of being that I could have around just unconditional love. Uh, there was a more powerful way of being that I could have around um, being my word to my family, like and being a demonstration of like, when I tell my kids I'm going to do something, I do it. And they can like, like becoming even more of a husband and a father that my wife and kids can absolutely count on, you know, can you share what that is like, what's more than that? Sorry, what, what, what? Ask that again. Can you share what that is? Like, what's being more than your word? What's being? What's what's a more powerful way of being than that? Yeah, I don't know that there is, but I think that there's stages of like being your word. Meaning, there's this, you know, like, like yesterday I had an example. So I grew up in a kind of I grew up in a ranching rodeo family, and so I compete a little bit. I don't as much anymore, but I still have horses, and so we keep our horses over at my dad's property. And so occasionally I'll haul some hay for him because he's in his 80s. And so I'll haul hay. Well, on Sunday evening, I told my dad, I said, hey, I'll, I'll haul four bales of hay down you know, to the corrals tomorrow. Well, about the time I remembered it, it was evening time. 
I was back to back from 11 to five, which I usually don't have those kind of days. And I try not to set those up, but it just happened. I was exhausted. I didn't want to change. And I, I could have easily renegotiated with my dad and said, Hey dad, I'm not going to come over tonight, but I'll be there on Tuesday. And he'd have been fine with it. And what I'm learning from Steve is that the only time you ever want to renegotiate your word is if you physically can't do what you said you're going to do. So the only reason I would have not done it was just, it wasn't because I couldn't have done it. It was just, I didn't feel like it or was out of inconvenience. And so I could have told my dad, Hey, I I'm letting you know, I will not be there today, but I'll be there tomorrow and still technically been my word. Mm -hmm. But to me, the truer essence of being my word was, no, I'm going to go haul the hay because I said I would. Or, hey, I'm going to go hit the baseball in the backyard with my son because I told him I would for no other reason, even though I could renegotiate. And it's just like being a person that your family can count on to do what you say you're going to do when you say you're going to do it. And being a person that doesn't make commitments and then looks for ways to get out of them. Being mm -hmm. a person that when you make commitments, you actually look for ways to keep them. Yeah. And that's created a ripple effect actually in our home where, you know, my kids are saying things like, oh yeah, I was going to do this, but I realized that wouldn't be being my word. And so I did it. Or, hey, I was at, you know, Mod Pizza the other night after our soccer game on our teams traveling home and the lady forgot to ring me up and she got really busy and she was taking forever and I was kind of frustrated. So my son was like, I was tempted to just leave and they wouldn't have known. But I realized like, yeah, that wouldn't be being my word. And so I stood in line and paid for my pizza. You know, it's just like, you know, more is caught than taught yeah. by our kids, you know? Yeah, no, I love it. I, um, so before we hit record, we were talking and you, you know, you were telling me about your company where you were teaching and training leaders. Um, and then your wife and you had the idea to start bringing that, those same principles into families. How do you establish that? Like, tell me about what goes on in your home where you actually teach your kids these principles of being. Yeah, it's interesting. I think as entrepreneurs, my, for myself, Eric, and for most of the entrepreneurs I talk with, most everyone agrees that it seems to come more naturally to us as entrepreneurs to be intentional in our businesses mm -hmm. than it does to be intentional in our homes. Very true. And so there's this real risk that sometimes our families are getting what's left of us, not the best of us. Mm. So we give the best of us to our business, our clients, our community, right? Our following. And then what little we have left over, it's like, okay, family, feast on the scraps of what's left over. And so it's an interesting thought, but it requires intention to be intentional. So you're going to have to be intentional about being intentional in your home because it won't come as natural to you as an entrepreneur as it does in your business. Hey, real quick, I want to thank you so much for listening into this episode and just bear with me. we got a one minute commercial coming your way. Have you ever blocked off time to do some lead gen or cold call or read a book or write a book, whatever that may be for you, and then when that time comes, you just simply don't do it. You find other busy things to do, like maybe check your emails and clean out your inbox, things like that. Well, look, if, if you find yourself doing that, you're not alone, okay? If you're an entrepreneur, solopreneur, or someone in the field of selling, chances are there are areas of your life where you're not performing the way you wanna perform. You probably feel alone. You don't know which steps you need to take next. Look, this is exactly why we created Relentless Goal Achievers. We're a group of growth-minded individuals who have an opportunity to meet three times weekly, although it's optional, three times weekly to talk about our goals, learn new things, and take our businesses and our life to that next level. Here, click the button below. See if you might be a good fit. I think this is the group you've been searching for. I'll see you in there. It requires intention to be intentional. How do you develop? I feel like intention is something you develop. Yeah, well, and 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 I think first and foremost, it starts with just this awareness of like, look, I want to be as intentional in my home as I'm in my business, mm. right? So what do I do in my business as an entrepreneur? Well, I really pour into building a brand. I pour into differentiating myself. I pour into this, like creating an identity that makes us unique. I pour into like growing myself and growing people and growing our team and growing our clients. Well, it's like, well, what if you just applied those? Like, what if it's like, well, I want to pour into building a brand for my family. I want to pour into creating identity for my family. I want to pour into my kids and help them grow, right? I want to develop myself. And so what, what happened with us is in our consulting company, we work with entrepreneurs and organizations to help them get really clear on their identity of what they want to be known for. And then translate that identity into leadership and language 
that they use to grow their company from a sales perspective and then grow from a culture perspective. And it creates these remarkable transformations. And our clients are often telling us we're more clear than we have ever been on who we are, what makes us unique and how to articulate that inside our company and outside. Well, I had the thought one day, like, well, I would love that same thing for my family. I would love us as a family to be able to say, we are more clear than we have ever been on who we are. And we're more clear than we've ever been on how that shows up for us as leadership and language in our inside of our home and how we communicate that out into the world. This is who we are. So we just took our family through my process as an experiment, but it ended up being a really profound experience for us. And then we, we so we created this family brand. It's our mission, our vision, our values, this way of being. And then family started asking us about it. Like, Hey, what is this? And like, what are these sayings you have on your, on your wall and your home and these values? And they would observe our kids and ask questions about them. And and so my wife felt really called. So she started a podcast called Family Brand three years ago that's done very well. And then she has familybrand.com and offers programs for families who want to be really intentional, you know, that just maybe have never had a blueprint or a system of knowing how to. And what's so interesting to me, Eric, and kind of sad, if you and I want to invest in the growth of our business, there are endless amounts of resources, probably too many, right? I can go find anything in a second about building my culture, building my brand, building my marketing, building funnels, advertising, right? Anything. If I want to go find the same type of resources to build and strengthen my family, you, you can't hardly find them. It seems to be that the only resources that are available for families is once there's a problem, rehab, therapy, counseling, and those are useful. But it's like, we want to help. We want to inspire more people to start more companies like family brand. We're not trying to like be like, Oh, we want to control everything. Like I want to inspire way more people to create more, way more resources so that families can proactively strengthen their family. Yeah. And, and what's interesting is there's no category for it though. So we when when in my bio, I said, we're the leaders of the family brand or the family development movement. That's a phrase that we've invented. It's like personal development, but for families, but you never hear the term family development. No, you don't. And so we're creating this movement where families can come and develop and grow as a family in all the areas that are meaningful to them, business, personal, marriage, parenting, health. Uh, but we just feel really called to, to strengthen families. How old are your kids? Uh, 16. So my oldest son, 16, then a son, 14, a daughter, 11, a son, eight, and then my youngest daughter is six. How did you get them on board to do this, especially the teenagers? Yeah. I mean, there's that saying, you know, those who help plan the battle don't battle the plan. And so I think that's also, also a really overlooked opportunity in companies. You have way too many like CEOs and founders who just come in one day and announce like, Hey, here's our mission, vision values, or they even, they announce it over an email. And none of the people had any opportunity to like help shape it. So they're not going to buy into it, you know? Mm -hmm. And so we walk that through in our program of, you know, a really easy, simple way to get your kids at appropriate ages to participate in this and really feel like they're helping shape it. And sometimes even like if you have a really reluctant teenager, which we've had clients who've had that, you almost get them to help shape it without them knowing they're shaping it. So sometimes the most useful thing for a teenager isn't to be like, hey, we're going to sit down and we're going to do a family exercise together and we're going to create our values. And they're like, yeah. oh my gosh, I'd rather do anything but that. Right. However, That's lame dad. <laughs> yeah. However, you could be driving them to practice. And you could just be having a conversation and you could just be like, Hey son, I've been thinking like, what do you think makes our family unique when you think about other families or, yeah. Hey, what do you think our family's known for? Like if we were to ask other families in our community, like, Hey, what, what, what are we known for? So there's ways to get insights. And then when it comes to the actual creation of we have, we help families create their seven core values in these really intentional categories of seven based off a lot of research and science. We didn't just randomly come up with seven. It's really backed by, again, a lot of research of what makes up strong families. That's been a really easy way to get your kids involved too because you give every member of the family a sheet of paper. And in every set, at all, every, uh, each of the seven categories is about 20 ideas and they can just circle some of their favorite ones. So it's not like you turn it over to your children. Obviously you're, you're the leaders of your home, your shape, you're driving it. But yeah, there's total way, there's totally ways to get them involved and help them, let them help shape it. And sometimes you have kids, depending on their ages, who are like, we have some families where like the kids are stoked. They think it's so fun and they think it's such a cool exercise. Then yeah, others are pretty reluctant. But it's not a reason not to do it. Yeah. I uh 
about a year ago, a year and a half ago, I took my son. Do you know uh, Bedros Koulian? Have you heard of yeah. him? Yeah. I actually spoke at one of his events back in the day to uh, his really? Fit Body Boot Camp uh, oh, franchisees. Cool. I had him on my show too. But oh, that's awesome. We went to his uh, Squire program. And the Squire program is like a rite of passage. It's a program for fathers and sons, yeah. 12 to 16. And, you know, he's got Ray Care, who's been on the show, and Matt, and like all these like Navy SEALs and special ops guys who are the instructors for the day, and Bedros too. And, uh, in that program, we established some core values, but we had, I mean, it was, he still talks about it. Like that program shaped his kind of how he's looking at the world after one day. And it sounds like what you're doing is almost like a, it's not a one day thing. It's like you're giving families tools to continually work with your kid. Cause this isn't a one and done. No, like by, by the following week, they're going to forget the values if you don't continue to reinforce them. So there is, how do you one get with your teenager, establish these things, but then also how do you reinforce them? How do you make them be those values? Yeah. So in the program we created, and here's what's so funny is when we first started taking families through the family brand program to help them create uh, first identify the kind of culture they want to create in their home, which is really interesting thought. Like what's the kind of culture we're trying to create here. Then we would help them shape their mission, vision, seven core values. And then we weren't really sharing any of the things around implementation that we had been doing for years because we just didn't even think it was that valuable because sometimes you're so close to it, you can't see it. Well, one of the families we took through it, it was when we were in Hawaii, living in Hawaii, and they were in our home and they they just observed us for a couple of days and the types of conversations we'd have around the dinner table. We have this thing around dinner where we go around, everyone says their best part of their day, the worst part of their day, and the weirdest part of their day, but we just call it best, worst, weirdest. And it's just a way to connect around the dinner table and like get insights into each other's day. And she was like, and then she saw our morning routine about how we say our values together. And she was like, these things you do, is that intentional? Or is that just once in a while? It's like, no, it's like a system. And she's like, well, why aren't you teaching me that? That might be the most valuable thing of this whole. And we're like, oh, yeah, maybe we should share. And so now we have this, you know, we, we call it the blueprint. That once you've identified the kind of culture you want to create, you've created your mission, vision, values. We share and teach you the blueprint, which is how to live your values daily, weekly, monthly, quarterly, and annually. Just like companies do, like companies have daily, weekly, quarterly, monthly, and annual cadences and rhythms. Well, even with the best of intentions, your family's not going to sustain any of this like a business wouldn't without these rhythms. And so we just teach these cadences. So one of our daily cadences is we eat breakfast together every morning as, as often as we can. We probably average about four, four or five days a week, but it's a real intention to eat breakfast together. And then we recite our values every morning. We try to eat dinner together every night. Best, worst, weirdest. Weekly, we do a two-on-one check-in where me and my wife have one of our children come in one at a time, and we just check in with them. How was last week? What's important to you this week? How can we support you this week? You know, my wife and I do a non-negotiable weekly date night, and our kids know we're going to do it. And by fa in fact, if by Saturday night we haven't gone on our date, our kids are calling us out. Hey, when are you guys going on your date? Yeah. We do monthly kid dates. We do a, my wife and I do a quarterly uh, get. We do a quarterly getaway, just the two of us, every quarter. And sometimes it's just for the day. Sometimes it's not even overnight. We have a big annual rhythm that we do around New Year's because we need it as much as anyone else or we'll forget it. Sure. But you got to live this. But man, if you do, Eric, it starts to shape your children's identity of who they see themselves as. And you start to raise way more confident, happy, loving kids who like who they are, who believe in who they are, who know who they are. Like the greatest leadership development opportunity that has ever existed in the history of the world is inside of our homes. I couldn't it's agree not in a two-day course. It's yeah. not in a book. Those are those are useful, but we wouldn't need as many of those as if we knew how to develop leaders in our homes. You just made me, um, you gave me goosebumps. I can't remember if it was Mother Teresa or Gandhi, but you know, if you want to change the world, go home and love your family, right? Yeah, and it's like, but but myself included, I can get really caught in the trap if I'm not careful of like, oh, I'm out there changing the world. And I can neglect my own home and family in my attempt to change the world in my business. And I think you can do both. I I, I know you can have both. You yeah. can be changing the world through your business and, and your purpose and your calling and your mission. And man, like. Talk to me you know, about that, Chris, because I mean, I'm, I'm listening to you and I get, I'm getting all these ideas. Right. And, but are you familiar with the disc model? Yeah. Behavioral style. So I'm a high I, high D, um, so I'm real quick action taker, right? I don't think through a big plan. I'm like, oh my God, this is a good idea. We're implementing it. But what happens is I overload my plate and uh, 
it's overwhelming. I just then I just don't most of the stuff doesn't get done. If yeah. I'm being completely honest, chances are none of that stuff gets done, right? Or it gets done to the the fullest extent that it could. So what how does somebody balance that, especially entrepreneurs? Or if you're talking about like homes that have a single parent where this is really needed. Totally. How how does somebody balance that? Like what's your process for creating? So first you have the intention, but then creating the plan, scheduling it out, implementing that plan. Like how do you do it? Yeah. And look, I I'm not going to pretend that that's always running smoothly in every area of my life. However, you and I talked about this a little bit before we hit record. I think a lot of people, Eric, have bought into what I believe is a lie and a myth that you're going to have to make huge compromises in some areas of your life and just let kind of that area of your life go for a while. Now, I'm not saying that some areas won't get more attention and more focus than others at times. However, I do believe it's possible to be intentional in your parenting, to have a great marriage, have a successful business or career, stay in decent shape and pursue some things that are meaningful to you. Mm. Like, I don't think one of those has to come at the expense of the other. Right. And I'm on a mission just personally to kind of dispel that and show like, you know, and I, I look, I struggle as much as anyone. And I can say, I spend a lot of intentional time with my kids. I have a great marriage that hasn't come easy. Like we were separated 14 years ago and going to get divorced. So what we have today, we've created it and worked for it. I have a business that inspires me. I'm, I feel like I'm in the best shape of my life at 41 and I still pursue things that are meaningful to me. However, what I think is really, really critical is you have to have a lens that you're looking through to make your decisions. Because without a lens to look through to make decisions of what aligns with you or what doesn't, you'll just say yes to everything, especially as an entrepreneur. And what you'll end up saying yes to, you'll overload your life with yeses around your business, which leaves very little capacity to be intentional in the other areas like parenting, marriage, health, and you talk to most entrepreneurs, Eric, where are they most overloaded and out of balance and misaligned in what area? Mainly, mainly their health and their family. But because they're overloaded in what area? As oh, because they're overloaded in a business. Yeah. Growing the business. And you ask them like, well, why do you say yes to all these opportunities and why not say no to, and they're like, well, I don't know. I just, because they don't have any kind of filter to look through. They don't right? realize they don't by any... saying yes to this, they're saying no to that. Totally. And what, what was interesting one -on -one is, real quick, and I'm sorry for interrupting. No, no, go ahead. What was super interesting is where your priorities lie. When you shared with me like where to place your intention, I didn't hear you having, you know, guys night out on there. I didn't hear you say it's possible to do all this and have a guy's night out and watch football with your buddies and go, you know, bar hopping. Like it was specific, right? I think it's people have people prioritize certain things and they leave out others. So you're just yeah. prioritizing the right things. And look, there's not, and I have nothing against the guys night out or watching football with your buddies or guys trips, you know, I, people have asked me, like, I've had some buddies who give me a hard time. Like, dude, why don't you come on more guys trips? And I'm like, look, I, I at most will go on one a year because I just, I know that any more than that for me, that's time I'm not spending in, in other areas that are, more, you know, sorry to, sorry to say buddies, my friends, but like more important to me, you yeah. know? And so it's like, it has to do with your priorities, but like, I, I meet a lot of entrepreneurs, like a new one-on-one -on -one coaching client that I was talking with yesterday. He's saying to me, no, my family is a huge priority. However, I just keep saying yes to every business opportunity that comes to me because I feel like I have to, because it's growth, 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 growth. And I really do believe his family is a priority. However, he doesn't have anything. He doesn't have a lens to look through to be able to give him the courage to say yes to some of his business opportunities and no to others. So he's not operating from a place of alignment. He's just operating from a place of opportunity. And I think that's a that really lens? hard thing as an entrepreneur to do. How do you get that lens to look through? Is that the values? Well, so there's two, there's two lenses. One is, well, yes. Okay. If I know what my family's values are and I know the type of culture I want to create in my home, that could be a lens that I could actually look through when making business decisions. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, and another distinction there that I love to talk about with entrepreneurs, is this decision going to be for my family or going to be done to my family? Because it's one or the other. Like every decision I make in business is either going to be for my family, meaning going to benefit us, or it's actually going to be done to my family and it's going to hurt us. And so I think about that when I'm saying yes to you know, requests that come into my world. 
Is this for my family or going to be done to my family? So that's one filter. The other lens that we look through just on the business side is we go really deep with businesses on their identity. So when, the, when a company first starts to come work with us, the very first question we ask them is, hey, what do you want to be known for that's bigger than your industry? So let's separate your industry from your identity. Let's separate what you do from who you are. Because look, your industry is great. What you do is great. But what I want to know is who are you at the core level, like the, the, like the deep purpose behind. And when people get clear on their identity that's bigger than their industry, that also becomes a lens to look through that when opportunities come into their world, they can now say, are we going to say yes to this just because it's a great opportunity? Or are we going to say yes to this because it's actually aligned with who we are and our mission and who we feel most called to serve? Dude, I meet entrepreneurs all the time who are working with clients they don't even like working with. Mm. And it's like, why yeah, are you I've doing been that? There. I've been there. It's terrible. I've fired clients before, but it took me way too long to realize that. Yeah. Uh, and guess what draining. the cost of that is? Yeah. yeah it's no. draining you. That You could be spending that time with your family, with your health, like, but they don't have any kind of lens to look through to know if it's yeah. aligned or not. So it's just like, well, I better say yes. So when you say you, so when, when a business hires you and you say separate who you are from what you do, are you talking to the CEO or are you getting the leaders together so they can come up with the business identity? What, what kind of answers do you get for that question? Like who are yeah. you as a business? Well, it, this could be kind of fun. Do you want to, do you want to just do it a little bit right now with your business? Yeah, let's do it. Okay. So if you had to describe to me tactically the industry you're in, what's the industry? Uh, coaching, training, consulting. And specifically around, is it B2B sales? I see your book back there. Uh, I used to be uh, for the sales trainings, but now, so Relentless Goal Achievers is group coaching. I started for entrepreneurs, solopreneurs, um, you know, small businesses where I host um, thinking partner calls, teaching calls, and they all hop in through Zoom. And I do that. Okay. I have one-on-one -on -one coaching. I go to corporate corporations and teach them disc or sales or, you know, got it. We got a few products. So if we were going to kind of be succinct, which I know we could dig into this more, but we would say, okay, Eric is in the industry of coaching, consulting, training, specifically around goal setting. Perfect. Okay. That's, and we could also say that's what you do. That's what I do. And, and some people think like that I'm trying to take a shot at what they do. And I'm like, no. So first and foremost, I think what you do is amazing. And I think all of us should be striving to be the best in the world at what we do. Yeah. You have great. However, Thank you. <laughs> they, yeah. <laughs> However, Eric, what do you think would be the risk or the challenge if we built your entire identity around your industry and what you do? If your, if your entire identity was built around goal setting in around coaching, training, consulting, what might be the risk in that? If my entire identity was built around goal setting, coaching, and consulting, what would be the risk in that? Well, that's not me. That's yeah. just what I do. And who else do you sound like? Everybody who's goal setting and training and consulting. Yes. Yeah. So like what, one of the things we, we, we don't realize a lot of times as entrepreneurs is we, we are the ones commoditizing ourselves. It's not like it's not like it's being done to us. We're the ones participating in commoditizing ourselves because we only talk about our industry and what we do. The problem is that's not who we are. That's not what makes us really unique. It's not our identity. So we separate your identity from your industry and we almost go, okay, coaching, consulting, training in the areas of goal setting is what we do. And look, we're the best in the world at it. We're amazing at it. However, there's an identity that's bigger than that. There's, there's a reason why we do it. There's the who we are in it. So if I was to start asking you more of those types of questions, like, well, who are you in it, Eric? Like, wh why is it so meaningful to you? Like, what do you see gets created as a possibility when people achieve their goals? Bro, people live free, man. My whole thing is to get people unshackled and let them live life freely. You know, I grew up, I grew up until I was 10 in a communist country. I came here from former USSR, saw what that does to people's mindsets. Dude, when I started my company, first day I went to my mom and I was so excited. And I told her, I said, mom, I started a company. I incorporated. Here's the paper. And she looked at me. She said, well, how much are they going to pay you? And just by understanding how we're shackled in our own minds and like every single time I work with a coach or talk to guys like you, I realize that I still have shackles on in different areas. Like today, I'm having so many aha moments just thinking about what I'm 
the possibilities I have for my family that are right there in front of me that I'm not taking advantage of. Um, I want to help people live free. That's who, that's who I am. Okay. You see the power of what just happened? Yeah, that was very empowering. And what's, what's interesting when you told me like your identity is tied up in goal setting and goal achieving, I, I went to like networking events where you get up and you, you know, talk about what you do. And I'm like, you know, we're a training and consulting come. It doesn't even, it, it's not empowering at all. No, everyone's like, this was empowering. If, if, if people were being honest, they'd be like, who cares? Like you sound like everyone right. else. And, but it, what's interesting no is like, going to remember, <laughs> no. And I don't think any of us, I've never met an entrepreneur, Eric, who's wakes up every morning. And is like, Hey, my goal for the day is to look and sound like everyone else in my industry and commoditize myself. That's right. No, one, no, but yet that's what we do so often in our message and our story. And, and we don't even, we've never really uncovered this identity. It's there the whole time. But just a simple little exercise of what we've done today, and there's way more we could do on it. But even like position, even think about this at your next networking event, you stand up and go, so helping individuals and organizations achieve goals they never thought possible is what I do. But helping people live free is who I am. I'm just going to drop this mic. <laughs> okay. Dude, and there, there's really so good. much more for us to unpack around freedom and like yeah. how that starts to get incorporated into your copy, your ad, your sales conversations. It's like, mm. yeah, this is what we do. And it's amazing, but this is who we are. And when you wake people up to their identity, and I'm talking in their business and also in their homes and their lives, when people start to wake up to who they truly are, that's, that's the power. That's the thing that we can scale. So another thing from just a practical application in a business, it's really tough to scale if it's just all around your identity, your, your industry and what you do. So one of the things that's hit me in my own business and a, and a hard lesson I had to learn is I'll never be able to scale beyond the identity I've created for my business. So if the identity I've created for my business is limited to coaching, consulting, training in my own world, well, I can scale to whatever that looks like. But if the identity I've created... so for you, it's freedom. For me, it's possibility. That's that. There's a way more opportunity to scale into an identity around possibility than just an industry of like coaching, consulting, training. And if I ever hope to have a team that's on fire and con as convicted about what I'm up to as I am, and if I ever hope to have a team that is actually so fired up that they'll step into leadership roles and start to lead and take weight off my shoulders, well, I sure as hell am not going to inspire them by my industry and what I do. It's the the identity and who I am. So I bet you could go find way more people who would be convicted to come alongside you around the idea of freedom and living free than mm. you ever would about goal setting. Right. And then you also have an opportunity in your own team to be like, oh, and I have to live that first for my own people. So what am I doing to help my own people be free? Because if they can get a taste of it, then they'll they'll come alongside me and go help others. What can I do to help my wife and children be more free? Just like this identity just starts to show up everywhere. Yeah. We just unlock that. And then that identity starts to get translated into leadership. How, how, who can I be as a leader around identity or sorry, around freedom? And then language, how do we start to speak more the language of freedom? And then to me, all of that equals possibility. You just start to experience more that's possible. Wow, that's and I think great. we just make it really complicated and it doesn't need to be. So the, the language of possibility, is that landmark? So what's interesting, a lot of people have asked me, have I ever attended landmark? And I haven't really. However, I've participated in some ontological leadership programs that when I trace back the genealogy, they were led back to landmark, which I'm kind of realizing most transformation work finds its way in one shape or another back to landmark. Um, so I'd always been fascinated with possibility since I was a kid, but yeah, that journey of leadership and ontological leadership because here's the thing that bothers me the most about leadership is when it's talked about in the context of like a management role uh, or yeah. a function. When I say leadership and when we teach our definition of leadership to entrepreneurs and organizations, every time Eric, they're like, man, I've never heard leadership talked about that way. What's your definition? So the first definition we have of leadership is your ability to help people see a bigger vision of what's possible for them I love than that. they've ever been able to see for themselves in any area of their life. The second definition is, and because you've helped them see that bigger vision, you're willing to challenge them more than they have ever been challenged while supporting them more than they have ever felt supported. 
Oof. That's powerful, man. Do you know what would happen if all leaders felt that way? I wouldn't spoke that way. Oh. We encourage people in sales, like in sales, and ro- most of the people who've been through our sales training, they end their sales calls if it's gone well, right? And I think it's, they'll say, hey, Eric, I just want you to know what you can count on from us in this relationship if we end up working together. Or, or now that we know we're going to work together, I want you to know what you can count on from us. You can count on us challenging you more than you have ever been challenged by another company because we believe in you and we're committed to helping you achieve goals that you never even thought were possible and achieving your full potential. And we can't do that without challenging you. So just know that when we challenge you, it's because we're committed to you, but also know that we're going to support you more than you have ever felt supported. And I promise you, you will never have felt so much love and possibility and support from anyone you've ever worked with, but that's what you can count on from us is we're going to challenge you. and We're going to support you. Love it. How do you help people see possibility? Like how do you define possibility? Yeah, to me, possibility is like, it's, it's, it's what exists beyond what you think is possible. So it's like, just make that up or do you actually see it for people? No, I think you can see it for people. Like, look, I, I promise you that if you and I sat together, there'd be some things around goal setting you could help me see because of your expertise and your life's experiences. And there's things that you could help me see around freedom that I just, I would never even be able to see it without you. Maybe there's things I could help you see around family that otherwise before that you didn't think were possible. You already did. <laughs> and, but to me, that's like, and, and to me, possibility and inspiration have a like really like maybe like brother and sister or first cousins, meaning the word inspire comes from Latin word inspirare, which means breathe into. So when you inspire I people. I always thought it was in spirit. Inspirare. So in means into, spirit means breathe. So when you inspire someone, you're literally like, like you're breathing life into them and filling them up. And that's kind of what I see as possibility when we speak possibility into people. They literally like physically, sometimes you'll see them like stand like, you know, and, and I just think it's so rare that, yeah, it's, it's sad that most, most husbands, wives, children, entrepreneurs, employees, it's actually really rare that they have someone in their life who's committed enough to them to consistently speak real possibility and it's rare that they have someone who's committed enough to them to challenge them and push them and support them. And that's what I've experienced from Steve. Like Steve has spoken more possibility into me than any, any person I've ever met. He's also challenged me. He's not afraid to like have hard conversations with me and wake me up when I could use it. And though he comes behind it with the support as well. It's not just, not just the challenge. It's the support. Well, man, I'll follow a person like that. What does that all of us- sound like? Can you give me an example of when that happened? Oh yeah. Like in our coaching session last week, I brought up a situation that I was kind of conflicted around where I kind of had two commitments going on and how do I choose? And he's like, well, you realize like you created that problem and you do realize this is a reoccurring pattern in your life. Right. And I was like, dang. And he walked me through some, I was like, he's like, this doesn't happen. Just this happens somewhat regularly with you. But if you could just have the courage to say no, when you know it's a no, but you feel bad and you do things out of obligation. And just that one little experience already this past week, three or four times, I felt tempted to like, you know, well, I'll tell this person yes. And I'll kind of tell this person maybe, but because of the, I was just like, no, I will not be doing that because, you know, it's like, it just helped me be more in integrity and more of my word and create less messes and less things to manage and deal with. But he just called me out and he's like, yeah, this is a reoccurring pattern. He's like, you've done it to me. You've been a little flaky with me at times. And I was like, dang, man, thank you for, Thank you for helping me see that. And then he's just constantly speaking possibility into me. Like, you know, one day I went to do a coaching session with him and I think it was just his intuition, but I was feeling a bit overwhelmed in my life and just wondering how am I doing as a husband, as a father, as a, and he literally walks into his coaching office. Very first thing he does is gives me a hug, which he usually does. But this time he's like, he, he held me in there a little longer and he goes, Hey, let me just, let me just tell you, you're doing an amazing job. You're a great husband. You're a great father. You're an inspiring lead. Like, and I could really, I could, I could really use that, you know, like that was supporting me. That was speaking possibility into me, but I think we're afraid to love people sometimes. I like think I I awkward say, or... I'm afraid to let people love me. Yeah. Could be that too. It's awkward. Like after my, I noticed that with Kusudi, which was so weird after our interview, we, we were chatting and he's like, Eric, you're a phenomenal interviewer. 
And I'm like, it just felt uncomfortable. I'm like, dude, I don't want to hear the word phenomenal coming out of another dude. And then as we've worked together and had more conversations, it's like, hmm, yeah, I got a problem with that. I, maybe I got daddy issues because daddy left when I was two. I don't know who the hell I got to figure this out because if I'm going to be loving to two boys, I better know how to accept love, you know, and that's well, been an aha moment. Yeah, like that's a profound in insight right there that you just had is, man, in order to give love freely, it'd probably be useful for me to receive love freely mm -hmm. from others. But most importantly, it'd probably be really important I receive love from myself freely. Because the more I can freely love who I am, the more I have to give to others. The more I can freely accept love from others, the more I have to give to others. And I also think, Eric, something that might serve this conversation is, I really think we've been taught kind of a lie or a myth most of our lives around this idea of like, well, is it okay to really be confident in who I am? Is it okay to like myself? Is it okay to believe in myself? Is it okay to have someone tell me, man, you're a phenomenal interviewer and me go, yeah, thank you. I've worked really hard to become that and just accept it with nothing around it. Mm -hmm. And the lie I think is, let's say you and I were at a networking event and out of nowhere, unannounced, a woman stands up. And just goes, hey, I'd like to make an announcement to everyone here in the networking event today. I would just like all of you to know that I'm a really incredible leader. And I've been blessed with some really amazing God-given gifts and talents. And with those talents, I know I can help a lot of people. And she sits down. Yeah. Most of us, if we're being honest. I'm throwing a tomato at that lady. Oh, yeah. Arrogant, <laughs> egotistical, narcissistic, weird. Like, how'd you fit your head through the door, right? Yeah. Then let's say a little while later, a guy stands up unannounced and goes, well, hey, I also would like to make an announcement. Unlike her, points singles her out, he goes, I'm not that big of a deal. I'm nothing important. I'm nothing special. I just show up and try my best. And he gets a standing ovation. Totally. Oh, that guy's yeah. so humble. Now, here's what I want. I hope everyone listening, I hope this re rewires this permanently in your brain. And I've, I've done this. I've shared this example with thousands and thousands and thousands of people and speaking all over the world. And I've never had anyone who didn't react the way you did ever. First person, arrogant, egotistical, self selfish. Second person, unselfish, humble, right? I said, most people are, were so flabbergasted by that woman's belief in herself and her saying, I'm amazing. And I've been given these God-given gifts that we missed the last sentence. I will even ask audience, do you remember what the last sentence was when I was using her example? No. It's, and with those gifts, I know that I can help and serve a lot of people. Mm. So then you relook at that and you're like, is that arrogant? Is her confidence and her boldness and her leadership selfish? Or is it actually really courageous and unselfish? Is it that she's willing to be courageous? She's willing to be bold. She's willing to embrace how much she matters so that she can go serve a lot of people, make a difference for a lot of people. And then we go back to the second guy who's unselfish and humble. And we think, well, who's the only person he talked about and thought the, the entire time? Himself. Yeah. It's like, wait, how's that unselfish? How's that humble? And when that hit me, man. So what's interesting, my entire life, I'd been the guy to deflect, never accept compliments, never acknowledge that I have gifts, always self-deprecate all, you know, mm -hmm. because I was trying to not make it about me. But oddly enough, I only made it about me. The second guy in, the, in an attempt to not make it about him, he only makes it about him. The first woman who we think makes it about her, it's not about her at all. And who do you think is going to serve more people more profoundly in their lifetime? Her. Her. And so one of the biggest things that we like in our coaching programs and our consulting is we're constantly telling entrepreneurs, you have to be more bold. The world is waiting for your boldness. There's lives who depend on your boldness. And I would actually say it's one of the biggest pieces of, we, we have our clients share wins every week in our group coaching calls. Every week, I already know, like before, the, the, the majority of the wins are gonna be around, oh, I, was, I was more bold than I ever have been in a sales conversation. And not only did I enroll the client, I served them. I was more bold with my team than I've ever been. I was more bold with my, my family. It's like, if we can just help people realize that by embracing now where you could cross the line with this is if you're like, Oh, I'm amazing. I'm talented. I'm gifted. And I'm better than you. Well, yeah, then we've lost our way. It's not, it has, you're not better than anyone. 
It's like, I'm willing to embrace my gifts. I'm willing to embrace love from others. I'm willing to embrace being bold. I'm even willing to embrace some swagger and some confidence. If that's what it takes to serve as many people as I could serve. Man, Chris, I could talk to you for hours, man. Absolutely. I'm, I'm really enjoying this conversation. Um, dude, that's incredible. So how does somebody, have you ever met an entrepreneur who only does it for the money? Like they don't, they don't have, when you separate the business from them, they don't have a bigger purpose or vision. They're just, Hey, I got to support my family. This is the business I'm in. This is what I'm doing. Yeah. How do you help them? Well, great question, because that comes up a lot with people in our pro coaching program, because we're teaching them the same thing. Mm -hmm. We're teaching them that, hey, when you go to get into a sales conversation or when you go to serve a prospective client, if you leave that conversation and you haven't helped them see a bigger vision of what's possible for their life or their business, you've, you've really missed an opportunity. If the only thing you've talked about is the goals that they already have, which I'm not saying is wrong, we should talk about the goals they already have, but there's a real opportunity to help them see that more is possible. And they'll go, well, what, what do we do when we ask someone about, we start trying to get them to talk about possibility and they literally have nothing because one of two things, either they've been so heads down for so long, just grinding that they've stopped thinking about possibility and dreaming, or they just aren't willing to, they just haven't been willing to go there. I say, well, that's where your leadership really starts. <laughs> so I have plenty of people, Eric, who are like, I don't know what's possible, man. I don't, I don't even think about that. And it's like, well, what's that like for you? What's that like for you to have a life where you don't ever think about what's possible? Mm. What's that like for you to have a life where you don't have dreams? Like, and I'd be willing to help you create it. You want to get started on it now? It's like, let's just start now. You know, and I can be with someone, you know, like you could probably with me, like if this is an area I have expertise in, like, let's say it's a financial planner and someone's like, oh, I don't know. I just want to retire with, with no debt. That's, that's the biggest vision I can see. It's like, great. That's awesome. And I can promise you there's way more that's possible for you than just retiring with no debt. And I'm so committed to you. I'm going to help you create that vision. And that's where our work's going to start together. What are some wow. things you love? What? It, so it doesn't mean I'm off the hook. Like if someone goes, well, I don't, I don't have any bigger vision of what's possible. That's where you decide if you're going to be a leader or a salesperson. <laughs> you wow. know? No, that's really good. All right. I know you got to get going, but before I let you go, if I was to meet your family today and I, and I asked them, all right, who are you as a family? What would the answer be? Yeah, we are committed to elevate and inspire others. That's it. Yep. So we, we have our mission, vision, values, but if we, you know, and we have our seven core values and we recite them, but we've identified as a family that our identity, if we had to put it all on one thing, it is our vision statement, which is like, we as a Smith family, we were put on this earth to elevate and inspire others. And as long as we live that, you know, we're good. What in are the seven home. core values? Well, yeah, and that's in our own home first, right? We got to inspire, elevate and inspire others and then out there in the world. But I can't tell you, Eric, even that one thing, how much I look through that lens, even in my business, I'll ask myself all the time, like, man, is this, is this, would like this content we're about to put out or this reel or this ad, like, is this really going to elevate and inspire others? Like we had a reel the other day that I didn't know my team, the caption they put on it was kind of like, it was, it was, it was a reel that I did about parenting. But the caption was like, most parents go wrong here. And as soon as I saw it, I called it. It's like, hey, we, we never put out content that's designed to make families or parents feel bad. I said, you know, I said, so what if we change that into a, a you know, something that elevated, because like most parents go wrong here. That's not elevating and inspiring. That doesn't have possible language of possibility in it, you know? Mm -hmm. But anyways. No, I love it. So where can people find you? Um, there's, there's two things. One, if the family calls to you, you can go to familybrand.com and we have a lot of amazing resources, a lot of free resources. We have an incredible quiz that you can actually take called, uh, if you go to familybrand.com forward slash quiz, it actually allows you to answer some questions that gives you some insight into the type of culture that you might have in your home right now. Wonderful. And then if you're on the business side, I'd love to give your listeners a gift. Um, it's a course that we used to sell, but we've just decided to make it free. And it's called gettheclaritycode.com. Awesome. Can we, so, uh, okay. It, it, that's an online like video course or? Yep, workbook. And so it'll actually help you get some clarity around your identity, your story, your message. Some of what you and I just did live kind of is fun here today. Yeah. And and look, people tell us when they go through it, they come out and they're like, man, I've got more clarity than I've ever had around 
you know, my identity and who I serve and how to maybe start saying it to people. So get claritycode.com. And then on the family side, it's, you know, familybrand.com forward slash quiz. I think those would be two really cool free resources for your community. Perfect. Chris, thank you so much for being with us, man. You've definitely elevated me today. So if by the end of the day, you're like, did I elevate anybody? <laughs> today, you've elevated me in more ways than you than you know. You've given me some ideas about how I can show up as a father differently, as a husband, as a leader of this family, in my business, how to separate what I do from who I'm, who I am. Things I was not thinking about until I had this conversation with you. So I'm grateful for you, my friend. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for having me on. Thanks for hosting the show. Yes, sir.